Okay, just talk. No, not great, eh? Okay, so we last time we ended up with uh, talking about uh, Cyclops lesions. Uh, John, do you want to tell us uh, uh, about uh, clinical assessment of instability? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, there are uh, two different kinds that are described in Campbell's. Um, with any in, in normal um, position, uh, there is a um, shift in the vertical axis away from center of tibia. Um, and, and this is a normal position, and the, the, they're basically describing the left knee here. So, um, and the, 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 the way you talk about instability is on the dis, uh, tibia from the femur. So, um, in um, uh, lateral and medial uh, position, uh, you, you have um, uh, anterolateral complex instability uh, where where the uh, tibia rotates um, to, to the uh, uh, right. Then there's anteromedial complex instability, and that's uh, from the lateral side with the medial to the left. Uh, then there's posterior lateral complex instability, that's self explanatory, posterior medial complex instability. And then there are, um, then there's a classification of a combined instabilities, um, simple or straight. One plane medial, one plane lateral, one plane posterior, one plane anterior. I don't think these exist, but that's what it's in the book. Uh, then there's rotatory instability, anteromedial, anterolateral, flexion approach, uh, extension, posterior lateral, and posterior medial. Um, and there's combined instability, anterolateral, anteromedial, rotatory. Anterolateral, posterolateral, rotatory, intermedial, posteromedial, rotatory. So, as you can um, hear from what I'm um, reading, is it, it's it's um, uh, not something that the radiologist is going to pick up uh, too much. Uh, this pretty much uh, with the orthopedic surgeon when he examines a patient um, to learn this. Process is not easy. I, um, I, th I think the orthopods, and I think men mentioned this before, depend on um, MRIs a lot more than uh, they, they do on their own examinations. Um, I, uh, I grew up examining these uh, before we had any anything but X-rays, and so you learn. Uh, by by feel rather than by uh, pictures, uh, and the MRI has come around and it's really helped a lot. Thank you, so John. That's basically it. All right. Okay, Elior, why don't you uh, take this one? <clears throat> okay, we see. So here's one, okay, uh -huh. so what you see here. I see tibial tunnel, maybe an ACL graft. Here's the next image. Um, okay, we see the entry of the tibial tunnel. It's in the middle third. Okay, okay we see some, some hardware signal on the femur, maybe a femoral tunnel. So what's happening on the femoral side here? Okay, so that's... Mm, So, okay, so there's, is that, I don't, I guess I don't see a femoral tunnel, but there's okay. some attachment there. Maybe the the graft is attaching to the posterior. So uh, this is another fecial sparing 
type surgery, which is called an over-the-top surgery, where uh, obviously this patient at this stage in their life uh, has closed uh, growth plates. Uh, but what happens is that uh, you uh, uh, you can either, you can have a tibial tunnel. Remember, the tibial growth plate uh, is much more resistant to uh, bar formation than the femoral one. So often surgeons are willing, as long as they stay relatively vertical and do a, a small orifice, are willing to go through the tibial growth plate, or you can go anterior to the growth plate like this. And then what happens is your graft does not go into the femur, it goes posterior to the femur, and is generally fixed to the posterior cortex by a number of different ways. This one actually wraps all the way around and comes back again. And this is called an, uh, an over-the-top procedure, which is a fecial sparing type uh, 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 fixation to compensate for an anterior cruciate ligament tear. Uh, this um, uh, is not used in adults uh, uh, this time in, in, in orthopedics, as far as I know. Right, I agree. Uh, and in children, as I mentioned earlier, um, I, I, I don't like going through the growth plate. I've, I've taken, I have taken out too many bars in my life to, to recommend this procedure. Uh, when you get a bar in a tibia or a femur, uh, yeah. it's, it's not an easy procedure to fix. The, this I, got pretty good at, I got pretty good at it because there are so many of them. Yeah. Um, the, the, this particular one actually does not have a tibial tunnel. This one stays outside the tibial cortex as well as the femoral cortex, but a number of them that I've seen, like this one, this one, yeah, that's, going, goes, that's going anterior to the tibia. Yeah, yeah. So, so they're different techniques. I'd be a little further away from the growth plate uh, with those uh, sutures because uh, you, know, you have to drill the holes, and that's a little close to the to the. If you can go back and may look at it again, John. Uh, right, right, right there. You, you see how close that that is to the growth plate. Um, it's so easy to damage that growth plate. You know, I, I'd give it about a quarter of an inch more room. There's no reason to be that close. Thanks, John. Okay, Taysom. All right, I see a tibial tunnel going through the middle third. Um, and perhaps this is another over-the-top um, fixation, but there's this... Uh, you know, no real graft present in a bunch of granulation tissue instead. Yeah. So here we can see it's marked thickening and increased signal intensity here. Tibial, you can see there's some widening of the of the tibial tunnel, the femur. It's very tendonotic, thick, and, uh, um, and then here we can see that there is. It would be interesting to know what uh, what, what's the time element here. In, in a procedure, I don't know that. Yeah, you know, because it looks like it's a very large. Um, I that probably um, um, from multiple t tendons. Maybe yeah. Well, although it doesn't look like they were on the right side, so yeah. Um, that's a Pretty large. Okay. Tendon replacement. Okay. Now, well, oh, well, forget it. Okay, so here's just one where here we can see there's a, a sub tendon coming down here to the tibial tubercle or something, something coming up here. And here we can see this is actually a native, this is a graft there. And if we keep following this, we can see that uh, here we can see a femoral tunnel, which is not in a very good position. Uh, this is uh, an old technique. I think we talked about it uh, once before in the lectures. This is called the Jones uh, technique, uh, where they actually take a portion of the patellar tendon 
Now, if it's too small, you may not be able to actually get it into a tunnel in the appropriate position. So they actually placed a tunnel here much closer to the articular surface, which means this is definitely not an isometric position, which means that uh, tensioning it is going to be difficult and it's going to be lax in some positions uh, and not in others. But that that's a Jones procedure uh, where the the femoral tunnel was not in a very good location. John? I, I've done uh, probably maybe between 10 and 20 of these. And if you have a patellar tendon like you have here, it's a pretty long one. Um, and uh, you, you probably could get away with that. Uh, uh, you take the center of the um, patellar, or patellar tendon and uh, the, the patellar bone, uh, distal uh, third, uh, part of it, the anterior part, maybe a quarter of an inch or so of, of, of the bone, and then you drill a hole in your femur posteriorly um, and superiorly, and you, you put the tendon in. If, if you have enough room, um, enough length, it, it, it can be done. You can also uh, um, remove the, the tibial part and bring it uh, more approximately and modify the Jones procedure um, by uh, removing the tibial attachment. Uh, this um, is a normal or so-called usual procedure of the Jones yeah. type. Yeah, uh, but, but, but you can uh, remove that uh, tendon from the distal tibia and bring it proximally and, 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 and replace the tendon that way. Yeah. Uh, just like the old way, except you don't go through the tibia. In the Jones procedure, you go over the top of it. Yeah, the, the, this isn't a technique that's used now. Now, instead, you'd use a bone tendon bone uh, typical graft with, uh, with femoral and tibial tunnels. But I just want to show this in case you see this in an older individual and uh, you're not confused by what it is. It, it may be back. Uh, so this is actually, actually the, uh, the procedure that's used at uh, femoral and tibial uh, bone uh, uh, procedure is not that far away from the Jones procedure. All you, that the only difference is the attachment to the tibia. Right. And, so, and, and uh, well, the, the location. And you move, and you move the, the uh, locations are colored down immediately. Yeah, you can be much more isometric in your positioning. Yeah. Much more anatomic with the current technique. That's, cor that's absolutely correct. Uh, so this is sixty-one-year-old male with uh, double bundle, and now has pain and instability. On these sagittal views, it looks like it looks like there are two tunnels in the um, posterior femur. It looks like the more distal one had a, uh, more. Oh, they're, in it. Uh, they're being too cute. Uh, and here we can see two tibial tunnels as well. And it looks like I can see some graft in both of them. I, I would never do that on a 61 year old male. Uh, uh, this is a, a, a way too much surgery. Yeah. So we can see that and you can see that there is a, a little tear of the uh, anterior medial bundle up here. So uh, this one, uh, this patient became not, unstable. Not well placed. No. So that was a failed double bundle. Okay, let's go on to the here. let's go on to the posterior cruciate ligament uh, back here, which you're all familiar with. So we can look at tendinosis and partial tearing. Uh, so what do you think, Robert? Here. Looking at the PCL, it looks like it's intact, but there's increased signal, so some tendinosis. Great. Uh, see, Elior, what do you think of this one? Okay. So the proximal attachment of the PCL 
looks like there's kind of this erosive change into the into the femur. So, so this well, uh, why don't you tell us where the tendon went, the re replacement, the graft? What, where is it uh, in the tibia? Oh yes, it's uh, yeah. There's a there's a tibial tunnel there, I think, or maybe it's at the, on the yeah, it's it's right uh, way way po posterior where it's supposed to be, and. Uh, it's a little distal, but that's okay. Um, so, so and then, uh, then what happens after that? Yeah, and then you can see it fixed down here. So I, I'm just pointing out here, uh, you can get tendinopathy of both the native as well as grafts. We'll talk the details about grafts uh, when we get uh, to a later section, okay, John? Where we'll talk okay. about the, the uh, no, I'm sorry. I just ways to 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 put in a PCL graph back here and the, the potential problems with each of the different techniques. Yeah, there are, there are many. That's the problem. Yeah. And and and, and that means that, that they're all not that good. <laughs> okay, Jason. All right. Um. I mean, I see uh, an intact PCO, I believe. Well, here's a portion of it that's intact, and here's um, a portion that's little, torn. With a little cyst, yeah. Okay. So this is a partial tear. Now, the PCL also has two bundles, like the ACL, and they're actually surgeries described where you do a dumbbell bundle, repair the PCL as well, though I, I've never seen one of those. Uh, but it's described, and there are some people who orthopedic surgeons right now who are championing the double bundle repair of the PCL, uh, but I've never seen one in Southern California. I, I used to go posterior uh, uh, open before arthroscopy, and, and I've never seen a double bundle. Yeah. Uh, the, can, you bring, can you bring back that other one more? Yeah, um, you're talking about tendinopathy, and um, what, what's interesting to me is that the tibia is displaced posterior, uh, in my opinion. What's your opinion, John? Uh, I probably... I'd like to see the whole study here. These are limited views, and they're a little bit at an angle. So we could be a little bit deceived by the angulation. But but again, I, I agree with you. It looks like the tibia is a little posterior with respect it's to It's a blux. It's a blux, and that's the problem. Yep. Um, well, that's my humble orthopedic opinion. Yeah, it probably means that the PCL is insufficient here. It's not. You got it. Really. Yep. Good. Good, good to pick up, John. Thank you. Uh, here we have uh, joint infusion with edema in the anterior tibia and then thickening of the proximal PCL. Okay. So we can see an anterior impaction injury, and then we can see an abnormality of the uh, posterior cruciate ligament. So what do you think is going on here? Uh, I think they probably had a hyperextension injury. Okay, good. Now, it could be that this is completely torn and we don't see it, and you had a subluxation with an impaction of the femur on the anterior part of the tibia, uh, but this was a hyperextension injury where you got a high-grade partial tear of the posterior cruciate ligament and impaction of the anterior tibia against the anterior femur, which we don't see an injury on the femur, just on the tibial side. So well, I, 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 in my opinion, the reason you don't see it is because the the other contact point on the femur is not visible in this cut. That's right. Good. Um, oh. All right. So we've got sagittal and corona of the knee. There's, looks did, like. Did John have something else to say? Uh, yeah. Did you have anything else to say, Dr. Dragutis? 
All right, so we have a sagittal and corona of the knee. There's edema uh, within the, what is it, the medial uh, tibial plateau and femoral condyle. Uh, and this was a hyperflexion. Is under a hyperextension injury where we can see the kissing lesions anteriorly. And with this, when you suspect a hyperextension injury, always go back and look carefully at the PCL. And here we can see the PCL is torn from its femoral attachment. Okay. It, it could be a ro rotational type of injury, John. Uh, yeah, as long as it had a hyperextensional component to it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they, these, uh, the literature tells you that it's one way or the other, um, or, or one plane. I don't think that one plane exists in injuries. I think there's always another component to it. Uh, that's just my opinion. I was going to write about it. I, Connect, collected a bunch of cases, but never got to it. Okay, so here we see um, edema on the tibial plateau and adjacent femoral condyle. Um, I mean, could this be another? Okay, so is that the the MCL? That's that's torn, okay. maybe. So you're worried about a hyperextension injury. And as John was saying, they're not all in one plane, so you also have probably a distraction injury on the medial side. Okay. Right? Yeah, you know, it's a medial co contact. So, so what do you want to look for next? You're concerned about a hyperextension injury? At the PCL. Right. We see a tear at its proximal attachment. Yeah, so again, here we can see, and the, you know, that's why we do both T2 and PD fat side images. Uh, sometimes the tear is better seen on T2, and sometimes it's better seen on the PD fat side, but often the extent and the severity of the tear is better seen on the T2s, because often when you have a tear, there's too much increased diffuse signal intensity, which kind of uh, masks the actual uh, extent of the tear. So that's one of the reasons why we get the non fat suppressed T2s in the sagittal plane. In this case, uh, we don't see it well in the T2. This is a lower grade injury. Okay, let's go on and talk about complete tears. What do you think about this, Jason? Well, that PCL looks completely torn and the uh, femur is subluxa anteriorly. anteriorly. Yeah. Uh, this looks like a complete tear of the mid substance of the PCL with, again, anterior subluxation yeah. of the femur. No, no, don't, don't say that. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a tibia that moves, not a femur. Okay, so where John's coming from is for the, for the orthopedic surgeon, when they examine the knee, uh, the patients are usually lying on their back or sitting. So the stable component is the femur, and the component that the orthopedic surgeon moves is the tibia. So the orthopedic surgeon likes to hear the instability as a function of the displacement of the tibia, not the femur. Oh. Yeah, the, the femur stays in place, so it's a tibia that moves. Yeah. Whereas the actual, when the actual injury occurs, often it's the foot that's on the ground uh, kind of the other way around, but for description purposes that fit with a clinical examination, the uh, uh, common uh, nomenclature is to uh, consider the femur to be the stable component and the tibia moving. Not everybody agrees with that, but uh, that, that's the way I look at it, and that's the way I was trained. And I go with the distal uh, bone, uh, not with the proximal bone. Yeah. And so there's a PCL tear. Okay. That was 3T. Now this is point 3T. All right. So we've got two sagittals of the knee. Uh, there's some increased signal in that 
PCL with a probable tear distally. Yeah, so it's really a distal tear of the tendinopathy and the rest of the tendon. So it's a distal PCL tear. Um, okay, we see be an avulsed fracture fragment off the lateral. I think it's the lateral tibial plateau. Yeah, this is the medial tibial plateau. All right, and uh, <laughs> that is—is is it a second? It's a reverse second. Okay. The second fracture is on the lateral side, and then yeah, that's a reverse. So gone, there's no gone. Yes. Yeah. So because uh, it's on the medial side. So the lateral side is associated with ACL tears. On the medial side, it's associated with PCL tears. And you can see that there's kind of an impaction injury on the lateral side here. Uh, so this was kind of a valgus injury that opened the medial side and uh, pulled the, uh, the uh, uh, medial margin of the tibial plateau kind of off here and tore the MCL. And then yeah, the, uh, the medial collateral ligament, the deep um, has been evolved. Yeah, well, well, yeah, except, yeah, the, the medial collateral ligament attaches here and way down here. So this is a tear of the medial collateral ligament, but with the, the bone displacement, you get a fracture of the of that medial margin of the medial tibial plateau. Looks like the PCL is okay, but if you go to the sagittal images, you can see the tear back here. Mm -hmm. so these are, uh, this is a very uncommon injury, and therefore reverse Sagan fractures aren't seen very often. Uh, but you know, if you're concerned about it on plane films, you can look for this, but I'm not, ever sure, I'm not sure I've ever seen it on a plane film, but they're very easy to see on the MR, but the show is the PCL. I, I, I've seen it on plane films in the I bet. old days. Um, usually this, this, this has to be a pretty significant impact. Um, yeah. And uh, probably a motorcycle jockey or something like that. Yeah. So this is an acute reverse Sagan fracture. So Taysen, what do you think of this one? It looks like there is a non-union of that um, reverse Sagan. Okay. And it's corticated. So this is a chronic reverse Sagan fracture. That's an old injury. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it looks like on these sagittal images, we have a uh, prominent um, protuberance of the posterior tibia, probably a, a chronic PCL avulsion. Uh, it, looks like there, it looks like there's a fracture there uh, right in that location. Good. One thing I can tell you that, that um, is that that there has to be a fusion of the um, physis uh, from the way I see it. So it, it, it's um, something that will have to be watched and then uh, that bone will have to have a um, removal of the bar and replace it with fat. Yeah, yeah, but that, I, I agree. You really have to watch this very carefully, though it looks to me like that that physial growth plate is pretty pretty close to being fused at this point. But you well, uh, that, uh, the one on the left side shows to me that it's fused. Uh, the one on the right is just another cut, I think, John, and it's yeah. not fused yet in that area. This, this, the bar is usually not not the entire crisis. Yeah, the, so the, it, this, this maybe is, a quarter of an inch, three eighths of an inch, or whatever. This is an acute fracture. Uh, this is the T1 image, and this is a T2 image, same location. This is acute one. Yeah, this is an acute fracture. No, I don't see blood though. So. Yeah, see, it's you see a lot of edema here in the bone. So this is a. No, I'm uh, talking about edema outside the bone. Right, right. 
like this one. So we have two sagittals. Looks like there's another avulsion of the distal attachment of the PCL with the DEMA. So this is in an adult rather than a teenager, obviously. And here you can see that avulsed fragment back here where the PCL attaches. Now, the, with the PCL, um, many times a surgery is not warranted. It a lot depends on uh, instability. Um, the PCL is probably only fixed uh, one out of five times or so. Um, the surgery is quite uh, extensive, and a lot of times um, it's left alone without being fixed. Thanks, John. Okay, so here we see the PCL. I don't see intact fibers. I think there's a mid substance tear. That's on 71405. Here's on 13107. Yeah, more intact fibers proximally, but still discontinuity. Yeah. Just a little. And on other cuts, you can see the black. You saw the black, we saw the black structure go all the way to the bone. So this one was not operated on and healed. And at this time, the patient had a stable examination, so these can't heal. These are more likely to heal than ACL tears because the PCL, uh, you know, the ACL is right, the, the capsule of the joint, the ligamentum mucosum, wraps right around the ACL and is often torn when the ACL is torn. If you have an isolated PCL injury where the ACL is not torn, the PCL is not next to the capsule, and the capsule is often not torn. And therefore, since this doesn't communicate with the joint space, uh, you have a higher likelihood of, of healing a PCL tear. And then as John was also kind of referring to, patients tolerate PCL tears much better than ACL tears in terms of the instability that they have. So most of the time, in my experience also, I followed the PCL tears, and they haven't been operated on if they're isolated. If you have both ACL and PCL tears, then there's a tendency to to repair both of them at the same time with grass. Yeah, usually, that uh, knee that's been dislocated. Um, the way you check these knees, uh, you you have the tape the patient on a table in a supine position with the knee flex, and then you press, and you and then you look at that. Uh, tibia and see if it's sagging posteriorly. If it's not sagging posteriorly, it's a, you can pretty much assume that it's, uh, it's stable. Of course, you also take your hands and you push, push on a proximal tibia uh, posteriorly and to see how much laxity there is. Um, and quite often, there is no laxity, so just leave things alone. Thank you, John. As far as grafts, there are many different ways to treat these, but the two major ones are using a, uh, a hardware construct to uh, attach the graft to the posterior aspect of the tibia uh, versus uh, putting in uh, basically suture anchors and tunnels uh, on both sides. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this, this shows uh, the type of... More, I, I've seen very few of these on the left uh, in Southern California. I see a, a lot more of these uh, where they have a tunnel. And, and when you do these tunnels, the weak point of this procedure is right here where you have what's called the killer turn, where the posterior part of the bone can uh, rub into the graft and produce a graft tear. And this is, a, this is what that killer turn looks like on MR. So this patient had uh, basically a knee dislocation, had ACL and PCL tears, <laughs> Head grafts on both of them, and this shows the killer turn <coughs> in the PCL graft, which is typically the the weak point in the procedure. So uh, if you get good uh, uh, union of the bone um, of the ligament of the bone um, uh, in, a, in a proximal portion, that that's usually not a problem. Um, but but that killer turn is where, where, where the ligament tears uh, with time if, if it's not stable. Good. Thank you. 
And as far as the native graph here, this just shows the the two uh, components of the, the typical PCL. In my experience is we rarely can differentiate the two different bands like we can commonly in the ACL, but we, in the PCL, it's much harder to, to see the two different bands. And uh, I hear they're coming down posteriorly here. <clears throat> when you put in the graph, there are characteristic locations uh, where the, where the, the PCL graphs uh, should occur. I uh, and uh, uh, I, I'm not, I, I, my own reading, I don't, uh, I'm not nearly as careful at describing the orifice of the posterior cruciate ligament uh, attachments as the anterior cruciate ligament because I don't think the actual uh, precise location of the orifices are really as important in the PCL as they are the ACL. And it's very difficult to find too on that. And if you get too cute with a drill, um, there are very bad things behind there, like like the, uh, some vessels that are very important and nerves and things like that. Yeah. So um, you've got to be a little careful. Yeah. Um, so the, the the main thing here is that the 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 tibial tunnel orifice should be pretty close to this posterior cortex. Uh, nope. And not not up here, uh, and this just shows that's not a very good position of the of the tibial tunnel. It really should be back here near the cortex. Yeah, it's outside the bone, not inside the bone. The femoral one is a little bit too low and anterior too in this particular case. Uh, that's not going to work. Yeah. Uh, let's see who's next. I think it's me. Okay, um, I guess we're looking at a PCL graph that's way too inferior for the tibial tunnel. Well, I don't really see much of a graph here. So, so here's the tibial tunnel, but the graft is torn mm -hmm. right into there. And so that was a PCL tear, graft tear. <clears throat> that looks like we have another PCL um, repair with the tibial tunnel that we can see. Yeah. Uh, looks like there are some fibers distally, but I'm I'm not sure I yeah. can see the proximal fibers. I don't see the proximal fibers really there. Yeah, and uh, there's also tunnel widening here, and this turned out to be a partial tear, and they actually replaced the graft when they went in. Okay. Okay, so it looks like there's been another PCL graft. Uh, let's say it's torn proximally. Here are the coronal images showing the area of the tear on the coronal STI stir images. Okay, so we see the PCL. I'm not. Doesn't look like it's attaching at its proximal. You have to have good X-ray control during these procedures and and, and uh, fluoroscopy. Uh, if you don't, you're going to have trouble. Um, There's edema there. Is that the Risberg? Yes, yeah, so that's Risberg ligament. And here on the Sagittal images, we can see that it has very indistinct margins, increasing in terms of the PCL is okay in this particular case. Yeah. But we can see in the risk curves like that up here, has increased signal intensity of them. This was a sprain of risk curves later. All right, looks like the. Uh origin of the PCL has a uh, traction, edema, and a well, gap right there? Well, actually, here's the PCL down here. We're not actually seeing the assertion origin of the PCL. Um, this is actually Risperg's ligament coming around. So this is the attachment side of Risperg's ligament. Okay. And we're seeing you arrive a lot of edema here. 
and this was uh, abnormally fissured testicular Frisberg's ligament. This was chronic traction injury of the bone uh, from the Frisberg's ligament with the sprain of Frisberg's ligament. We don't repair those. Yeah, right. Uh, what's interesting about this is 15 year old and the, the, the vices are completely closed and not even seen. Uh, uh, well, must be a female. Must be a female. Well, it is a female, but yeah. but that's still uh, yeah, um, pretty pretty mature. Yep. Uh, so we have a 62 year old female who was injured after stepping off a curb. Um, it looks like I am currently trying to figure out which side's medial and lateral. It looks like there's medial subluxation of the tibia with respect to the femur um and then the extensive yeah. bone marrow edema it looks probably so so this is probably uh this is probably the acl uh proximal origin this is probably the popliteal tendon so this is probably lateral this is probably medial uh, and then we, we can see that there's obviously a dislocation here with instability and uh this is what it looked like on the sagittal images. And you have both ACL and PCL tears, as well as collateral ligament tears, all from stepping off a curb. And you can see the impaction injury to the tibia here. That's a lot of injury from the curb. Yeah. Uh, the one thing that you worry about here is the vascular system. John, you gave it away. Oh, I'm sorry. Jeez, I didn't mean to. <laughs> Like, so the one thing you might want to ask in a situation like this is to do an MR angiogram and venogram. And what do you see here? Oh, there's a dissection. Yeah, probably a tear of, of, uh, of uh, the vein here. Uh, I mean, the artery, the artery. So you're right, this was a, an injury to the, to the artery there, which it displaces the the arteries here, and you'd want to look very carefully at the axial images at the flow pattern within the veins and the arteries here. But when you, anytime you see a dislocation, as John's alluding to, you have to worry about uh, vascular injury and neurologic injury. That's a posterior lateral rotational instability with subluxation. That's a, quite a quite a severe injury. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's the. Uh, Let's hope she, she keeps her knee. Right. Right. Okay. So, uh, any questions about ligament injuries? Okay. We'll we'll move on uh, tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, everybody, have a good afternoon. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.